Thanks so much, Jean. Um, actually, I teach at UCLA, but you know, that's okay. <laughs> um, uh, um, I hope everyone is doing well tonight. And um, I, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this month's uh, monthly meeting. So Dr. Sarah Hefner is an archeologist with the California Department of Water Resources, where she conducts cultural resource surveys and reviews projects for potential impacts to cultural resources as well as prepares a variety of cultural resources documents in compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act and Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. She received her doctorate in anthropology from the University of Nevada, Reno in 2012. Her dissertation explored the cross-cultural exchange of healthcare practices between Chinese and non-Chinese laborers at mining camps and urban sites in Nevada from 1860 to 1930. Over the past six years, she has been actively involved in the Chinese Railroad Workers of, in North America project, or CRR, WNAP, a multidisciplinary project that originated at Stanford University and brings together scholars from diverse fields of study to explore the untold story of the Chinese workers who labored along the transcontinental railroad and later regional railroads. Through her involvement with the CRR, WNAP, She's co-authored a book on Chinese railroad workers, written an article on Chinese railroad workers' healthcare practices for the journal Historical Archaeology, and, um, and co-authored an essay on the health and well-being of Chinese railroad workers for an edited book entitled The Chinese and the Iron Road. Most recently, she has been researching a collection of artifacts from one of the first excavations in California of the Chinese community, the 1969 Wairika Chinatown excavations. Um, very quickly, um, do know that Sarah will be giving a talk, but if at any time you do have a question, please go ahead and throw them in the Q&A section, right? And we will have a Q&A section at the end of the talk. All right, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Sarah. All right. Um, thank you, Dr. Fung, for the very nice introduction. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and hopefully we can get this figured out. So. All right. Can everyone see my screen? There we go. Okay, so um, actually, uh, Laureen, uh, just quick question. If you don't mind texting me when I'm getting close to my 40 minutes, that would be great. <clears throat> okay, so this talk focuses on um, the Wairika Chinatown excavations, and these were conducted in the spring of 1969 through cold weather and freezing temperatures by state parks archaeologists who were hired by um, what was then known as the California Division of Highways and Transportation, and now is Caltrans. And this was conducted in lieu of I-5 being constructed through Wairika at the Minor Street Interchange. <clears throat> and this was going to destroy um, large parts of what was left of the Chinese community. And currently, the archaeological collection from Wairika Chinatown is located at the State Archaeological Collections and Research Facility in McClellan, California. In addition to the artifacts, of which there are well over 13,000, the collection contains archival materials such as the original field notes, photographs, um, field, hand-drawn field maps, and a lot of um, original artifact studies that were done uh, when the collection was um, accessioned into the uh, museum in the late 70s. So all that information is available at SACRIP. And I've been studying this collection uh, for the past three to four years. And um, it's recently, uh, first, sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself here. Okay, um, so just to orient you of where this is located, um, this is Northwestern California. Here's Wairika, <clears throat> and then this is uh, topographic map kind of showing the location of uh, where the excavations were in relationship to the rest of town. All right, and uh, this work has recently culminated in um, the volume 36 publication of state parks, uh, they're called Publications in Cultural Heritage, and uh, what's great is it's available online and um, I've put a link to the report here, but you can go to this website and download a PDF of the report as well as all the appendices. So um, that is available to read. Um, 
Okay, so I want to start by giving uh, a little background on um, Wairika's, I'm, I'm going to call it, it's the third Chinatown because the other two locations um, were located more in the central part of town in Wairika. And the third Chinese community was really the focus of those 1969 excavations. So following a series of fires, and the last being in 1886, that destroyed Chinese and non-Chinese businesses' homes, the Chinese community was forcibly relocated away from the main part of town. The Anglo-American community of Wairika blamed the Chinese community for the severity of numerous past fires that have devastated both Chinese and non-Chinese homes and businesses. They viewed Chinatowns as being composed of flimsy, crowded structures that were fire hazards and they wanted to create a barrier between the Anglo-American population and the Chinese population of Wairika. Now, the area that they were moved to was in a rather undesirable part of town. Um, it was located east of Wairika Creek, and it was sort of um, west of the Wairika Railroad tracks. And I'll, I'll show you some photos after this, but it was really pretty segregated from the rest of the town. And um, it was in an undesirable location, and very prone to flooding because of its proximity, sort of being sandwiched between Wairika Creek and the railroad tracks. It was not very well connected to the community. In the wintertime when the Wairika Creek waters were high, the creek was crossed on a two plank wooden bridge. So also didn't have a lot of um, transportation connections to it. And soon after moving to this location, um, Wairika Creek flooded over its banks in 1890 and washed away both the footbridge leading to um, the main part of town, as well as about seven to eight houses. And while some individuals chose to leave after the flooding, many rebuilt. Um, but most of the Anglo-American population was concerned with rebuilding the recently built railroad bridge rather than actually helping those who had lost their homes. By 1900, there were 86 Chinese recorded as living in Wairika. Most were miners and cooks. Um, there were no women listed in the census at this time, but there were four children recorded. I keep thinking the arrow button on my keyboard will advance the slides. <laughs> it's not. Um, so here are some historical photographs. <clears throat> this is from the 1890s. It's a, a little bit grainy, but um, just to point out some things here, Center Street. Here are the railroad tracks um, and Wairika Creek. So you can see the distance from the rest of the community and, and how it's sort of really um, squished in here between the creek and the, and the tracks. Um, a couple other photos. This is a little bit more um, zoomed in. Here we have the creek again, the railroad tracks, and then East Center Street um, coming in like this. And then um, some pretty devastating photos of the flood. This is uh, the first, first of many floods that occurred in this area. And these are the tops of buildings just sort of being washed away. Um, and again, this was in the 1890s. And then this was uh, around 1900, soon after the Chinese rebuilt. And you can see um, this was a former location of those structures. Um, here is the creek. And you can see how they sort of uh, moved their buildings back to, to leave uh, additional space for um, anticipating more flooding. And then I want to talk a little bit about population um, rise and decline in the mid 1900s. Um, so starting from the 1910s to 1940s, there's a fairly steady decline in the population in part because of the mines, the plaster mining in the area um, being played out, as well as anti-Chinese discrimination. And also just because this was not a, a great place to live. It was um, a lot of flooding and they also had a, a couple of fires in this area. So um, eventually they decided to, to move away from um, Wairika. From 1900 to 1910, the population declined from about 86 to 37 individuals. And by 1920, there were 21 Chinese um, enum enumerated in the census for Wairika. Um, there were no women listed in the 1920 census. However, there were four boys and one girl. 
and uh, additional disasters battered the community, including a fire in 1923 that left around 20 individuals homeless and another flood in 1927. So um, they really didn't catch much of a break at this location. Um, but despite these hardships, the uh, population actually um, increased slightly from 21 to 39 individuals from 1920 to 1930. And um, this is a Sanborn fire insurance map. This is probably one of the, the first uh, maps that we have that show the, this third location. And this is the focus of those um, 1969 excavations. And this probably was published after that flood. Um, you can see Chinese dwellings old and dilapidated and then several vacant buildings. And then um, again, some more pictures of flooding. This is a 1927 flood. And I want to note this uh, line of locust trees that are planted here, because you'll see this in several other photos. And in this case, uh, the, flood, uh, the floodwaters came just right up to everyone's sort of front porch here. So uh, not quite as devastating as the 1890 flood, but still very severe. Okay, and then uh, Chinatown in the 1940s. By 1940, there were only three um, Chinese individuals who were um, listed in the federal census as living in Wairika. And um, unlike some of the earlier census records, they actually have names. Um, many of the earlier records uh, don't individually name these, these people. So uh, we have Jimmy Wong, who was a cook working at the Wairika Inn. Gilbert Fong, also a cook. And Deer Chomling, who was listed as a gantry man. And a question for all of you, maybe maybe for later. Um, I found several definitions of what a gantry man was, uh, including someone who operates a crane, um, a skilled builder, as well as someone who shovels coal. So, if if you know uh, if you've seen that term around and you know uh, what what a gantry man is, uh, please let me know uh, because I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> Um, by 1947, the city building inspector visited what was remaining of Wairika's Chinese community and declared that the buildings be demolished and replaced with modern homes. While most of the buildings were removed, at least one building that faced um, East Center Street was remaining. And this area um, was never actually redeveloped. So where did they go? Um, likely moved to larger, more established Chinatowns such as Seattle or Portland that would have more offered more economic opportunities. Some may have chosen to return home. And this is an area of my research um, that I need to focus a little bit more on. Um, I'd like to spend some more time looking at immigration records and census re research to really try and track where these individuals um, went to because obviously they didn't just disappear. Um, but this is something I need to to do a little bit more research on. Okay. <clears throat> and this is an aerial from 1946. You can see uh, four or five structures here, and then the one structure here, this is um, East Center Street, and then this is Minor Street. And again, we have railroad tracks and Wairika Creek. And then um, bringing it up to closer to the time of when the excavations occurred, 1955, if you remember that row of locust trees, it's still remaining. And we only have one building now. And then uh, this is from uh, California Division of Highways, now Caltrans. This is a right-of-way record map. And from this, we can see uh, the two um, Chinese names here, Harry An and his wife, and Li Shi An, um, both in, still remaining at this location. And then finally, um, I do enjoy maps. This is an as-built plan from Caltrans. Um, this was published uh, just before they did the excavations. And um, this shows their plans for um, I-5. So you have minor, sorry, Center Street and Minor Street um, sort of being brought together here. Here's the creek. So the Chinese community would have been um, right about here. And so you can see how um, this would have gone right through what was left of the community. Okay, so 
Now moving on to looking at the excavations. These were um, very large scale excavations and um, what we would call in, in archaeology salvage excavations. So the goal was to recover as much as possible in a very short period of time. And in addition to state parks archaeologists, there were also local volunteers and students from Cal State University and Chico State University who helped out with this excavation. And um, in my report, I had interviewed some of the archaeologists who worked on the excavation just to kind of get a sense of what it was like. And um, they said that uh, weather-wise, it was very miserable. It was very hard work, but there was a, a great deal of uh, camaraderie um, between the individuals. So um, interesting, interesting stories being told about this excavation. Um, so there were two large areas explored, areas A and B. A was situated in the area on the Sanborn map that was labeled as Chinese dwellings and old and dilapidated. And area B was located southwest of area A, and this was believed to be the location of a two-story building that was depicted on historical photographs. Um, they excavated a combination of trenches and units, 63 units in area A, and 10 units and two trenches in area B. Um, as I mentioned, very large scale excavation. Um, if you've done archaeology, sometimes we do like 50 by 50 meter, um, or depending on what part of the country you're in, like a three by three foot excavation unit. But these were huge. These were five by 15 feet, 10 by 15 feet, uh, 10 by 10 feet. So really designed to move as much dirt as possible. And the problem with this is there was a little stratigraphic control and uh, most of the material was not screened. Any faunal or botanical remains were not collected and uh, mostly diagnostic or complete items were collected. Um, all in all, archeologists discovered nine features, um, all of which were located in this area A. And most were hollow filled features, meaning um, uh, wells, cisterns, and refuse pits. And um, I love these photos just because of the way that they used to uh, cut the edges of photographs. Um, these are, I think, pretty neat. So these are located at um, Sacra, and there are several photos like this of the excavation. But you can see how much dirt is just being moved. Um, and this is that row of locust trees um, that I showed you in some of the, the photographs. And so they really tried to, to position the excavation um, in line with those locust trees. And here's a fun photo showing some Chinese brown glaze sto stoneware storage jars in feature eight and a barrel strap. Okay. So what did they leave behind? Um, over 13,000 historical artifacts were cataloged. And um, in my work on the catalog, I decided to organize the, the artifacts into what I call functional categories. And this can help um, in terms of comparing with other archeological sites, but also in understanding use and activity areas, as well as consumer preferences. Um, so to give you an example, you might have a primary function like activity and a secondary function like transportation, um, and that would be, or currency and exchange. And I uh, use activity areas for example, on a community-wide scale, you could get an understanding of where various businesses were located. For example, where was the restaurant, a laundry, a herb shop? Or on an individual family level, um, where was the kitchen, where was the bathroom, or where did individuals sleep, and so on. Um, the largest number of items in the collection relate to domestic use and include things like food storage, food preparation and consumption, and furniture and furnishings. Artifacts date from the mid-1850s mid through the 1960s. Unfortunately, the excavation um, area had been pot hunted in the past and people were using this <clears throat> for dumping the refuse up through um, the 1960s. So there was a lot of mixing of artifacts at this location. Um, looking at the artifacts and combining with archival research can aid in addressing questions related to economic subsistence and strategies, dietary preferences, and health care. And I'll just go through a couple of these. 
The research theme of economic strategies looks at how individuals made a living and sustained themselves. It also looks if um, individuals were working more than one job or if they were um, adaptively reusing certain items. According to census records, mining remained the most common occupation in Wairika until 1910. And then um, being a cook was the second most commonly listed occupation in the census records. Um, now there was a fairly large successful mining, plaster mining operation that was located behind um, what is now the Wairika High School. And it was operated by, I think it was the Bing Tong Company. I'd have to double check the name, but from about 1886 to the late 1890s. And it was very successful in that time. Um, it yielded about $100,000 um, worth of gold. And so many of the miners worked for this company. Um, looking at the census records, some individuals either worked more than one job or had more than one um, role in, in a certain job. For example, cook and miner, cook and janitor, and servant and gardener. Others may have chosen to supplement their primary income by mending clothes, selling vegetables, or performing various odd jobs. And if we look at the artifacts in the collection, there were 25 sewing-related items, including parts of sewing machines, thimbles, um, tons of buttons, safety pins, and a crochet hook, as well as 118 tools. And, and this really surprised me, the number of tools <laughs> that were in this collection. Um, examples include files, ax heads, and whetstones. So individuals might have been um, doing some woodworking and doing their own home repairs, as well as mending their own clothes and sewing. Um, and I hope you can see this okay. <clears throat> it's a little tiny, but I'll, I'll highlight some things here. And so this is 1880. And here are some of the multiple, uh, these individuals a cook, both a cook and servant. We have a cook and a janitor, and then we also have someone listed as being a servant or gardener. Okay. So moving along to dietary choices, this explores dietary preferences of Wairika's Chinese community, including looking at types of foods consumed, food preparation techniques, and food procurement. Um, and again, unfortunately, due to the salvage nature of the excavation, faunal and floral materials were not collected. Um, and this is a real shame because you can learn a lot from studying um, bones from animals left behind at archaeological sites, and they can reveal a lot about diet and sometimes healthcare as well. So we're, we're missing that data. However, um, artifacts associated with food storage, food prep, and food consumption can provide clues as to what individuals were consuming. Traditional foodstuffs such as rice, pickled vegetables, salted fish, ginger, and soybeans were likely imported from China and sold by local merchants. At any time um, in the census records that I looked at, there were five to six Chinese merchants operating in Wairika. Meals were prepared with the aid of grinding bowls, shallow stoneware cooking pans, metal frying pans, metal woks, and meat cleavers. Various sizes and shapes of stoneware storage vessels were used to keep food fresh and free from contaminants. In addition, the presence of numerous cartridge shell casings as well as a fishing lure suggests individuals supplemented their diet with wild fish and game. At the Jacksonville Quarter site in Oregon, which is about an hour from Wairika, mammal species recovered include deer, black bear, and fox, as well as a variety of domestic species. Species of fowl in the collection, such as pigeon and turkey, might have been hunted. Also identified were local fish species, including salmon and trout. Um, and backyard gardening, um, looking at some historical photographs of Wairika's Chinese community. So show backyard areas with numerous sheds and other outbuildings as well as fencing areas that might have been used for livestock or for tending gardens. Gardeners are also listed as occupations in the 1880 and 1920 censuses. Items related to gardening and or lawn maintenance in the Wairika collection include a sprinkler nozzle, flower pot fragments, axe heads, saw blades, rakes, and a hoe blade. 
and on for some fun artifact photos here. Uh, the top left is a fragment of a stoneware vessel um, unglazed on the interior and it was either scored with a knife or some other sharp implement and could be used for um, grinding herbs. And these are several different stoneware storage vessels um, with a either dark black or light brown um, brown glaze. These are unglazed lids that would have gone over a type of vessel called a barrel jar. And then um, there are several fragments of chopsticks in the collection. And the other thing I want to note is that they were also likely using um, European American um, dining ware as well as utensils. Um, there are quite a few um, fragments of uh, European American porcelain and tablewares in the collection as well. And this is something I came upon in my research that I wanted to share because I think it's really neat. Um, <clears throat> in their reanalysis of Chinese uh, round glazed stoneware storage vessels recovered from the 1990 Sacramento H156 project, Yang and Hellman interviewed 10 Chinese elders to gain a better understanding of how these vessels were used, as well as what was stored in them and what they were commonly called. Included, they included a table looking at um, both Mandarin, Cantonese, Chinese character, and English translations of commonly used storage vessels. And so I took their table and sort of adapted it for the Wairika collection. I also included um, what we use in archaeology typically to refer to these vessels. And from their interviews, they learned um, interesting information about what was stored in these jars that uh, as, as an archaeologist um, we often think of the jars being only for one or two single uses. Um, so to give an example, um, globular jars or ing, these have a bulbous shape with a rolled rim. Some have lug handles for a rope. The original content of many of these jars was distilled liquor, although they have, may have also had oil. According to their interviews with Chinese elders, stores and taverns used the larger ones to ship liquids, while the medium and small ones were used in households. These vessels were also used to hold pickled carrots, scallions, salted cabbage, melons, ginger, and salted duck eggs. And I brought this photo up again just to show you um, from left to right. This is a shoulder jar, a spouted jar, and then this is kind of unique. It's, it's a smaller version of um, what you might think of like a tiger whiskey jar, um, but it's, uh, there are a couple in the collection and they're pretty unique. And I mentioned um, backyard gardening. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of these photos are rather grainy, um, but you can see um, a number of fenced in areas and perhaps small um, sheds in the backyards here. So it's likely individuals may have had livestock or been um, gardening. Okay. And then this is a topic that I'm particularly interested in, is looking at healthcare. So this research theme explores how individuals in the community um, took care of themselves when sick, what they did in terms of both minor and serious ailments and what sorts of treatments they relied upon. In the Wairika collection, we have both um, traditional Chinese medicines as well as non-traditional European American medicines. Examples include medicine vials and bottles, extract bottles, and a syringe. Other artifacts in the collection that might have been used for medicinal treatments, but that we may not typically associate with uh, medicine, include a variety of opium smoking paraphernalia, the scored stoneware cooking pans for grinding herbs, liquor jars and coins, and coins possibly used for scraping or gua sha. And of these medicinal vials, there, there are actually 115 of them. Uh, most are Chinese in origin, and they're these little small um, aqua hand-blown glass vials. They typically contain either a single dose of a pill, powder, or oil. And in good preservation conditions, you may find them with a paper label um, sealed with a wax covered cork. And later these were embossed. Most of the European American medicines are patent medicines. 
And these medicines claim to cure a variety of different ailments. Um, most of the time they contain primarily large amounts of alcohol, um, bitter herbs, uh, water, and then sometimes uh, heavy drugs. <clears throat> so not, not actually making a person better, but they might make you feel better. <laughs> Um, and looking at uh, census records, the 1880 census lists four Chinese doctors. And um, Su Fang Chung actually pointed me towards a 1913 international Chinese business directory. And this lists um, one Chinese drugstore in Wairika. Um, and it was the Chang Wong Ting and Company drugstore. And on to some more fun artifact photos. Um, we have some, uh, these are homeopathic vials. And homeopathy was introduced by Samuel Hahnemann into the United States, I want to say in the 1830s, 1840s. Um, but typically, this would rely upon using um, very tiny doses of uh, herbs or minerals um, to create an effect similar to uh, what you would have when you were sick. And these could be, uh, these were actually sold in the Sears catalog. I found a, an ad for these. So this is something you could order and use to self-treat. Um, and then here we have a, a little syringe here. <clears throat> Some more photos of that scored uh, stoneware um, container. This is a Chinese medicine vial. Um, you'll see a lot of these if you're working on Chinese archeological sites. Um, they tend to preserve pretty well because they're very compact and of course they're glass. And then on the bottom right is a bottle that contained crystallized ginger. Um, and this is probably rather unreadable, but <laughs> I put it up here anyways. Um, this is just, I, I created a table of some of the uh, patent medicines in the Wairika Chinatown collection. And you can see, um, the date ranges and then they really claim to cure a bunch of different ailments um, whether or not they, they were effective at all I'm not sure but um, for example uh, Dr. J Hostetter's stomach bitters this is a really popular one um, could contain up to nearly 50 percent alcohol and then uh, the final part of looking at healthcare is some recent uh, analysis that has been done by um, students at the University of Idaho in their chemistry department. Um, I sent about 16 bottles to the chemistry department for uh, to be studied and so they do a variety of different tests on these bottles and look at what contain what uh, was inside them. So in this example, um, these three bottles contain traces of what are known as stone drugs in Chinese medicine. And you might have heard this term before because this kind of study has been done at other uh, Chinese committees such as Jacksonville's Chinese Quarter in Oregon, um, also in Sandpoint, Idaho, and at San Jose's Market Street Chinatown. Um, so this, is, this kind of study is becoming very popular. Um, and in these three bottles, um, we have one that contained um, cinnabar or mercuric sulfide used to treat a variety of bacterial and fungal infections, real gar or arsenic disulfide used as a bactericide, detoxicant, and antiparasitic agent, and chalcoprite pyrite used in Chinese medicine to regulate and strengthen the liver. And um, I definitely have some more examples, but I wanted to highlight the stone drugs because um, you see these a lot with some of these studies that have been done. So. Uh, pretty neat stuff. All right, and then, um, gosh, I think I wrapped it up a little bit early here, but um, conclusion on future directions. Um, I want to spend more time reaching out to descendant communities. I, I did make some effort at the beginning, but really um, did not hear from a lot of people. So I wanted to, I want to ramp up uh, my efforts to um, try and contact individuals because I know that people didn't just disappear from Wairika, so I'd like to know where they went to, and I'd love to be able to connect with people um, who may have lived there or who had ancestors or relatives that lived in Wairika. Um, additional newspaper archival research. Um, unfortunately, the 
some of the Wairika journals and newspapers are not digitized, they're not available online, and they're not uh, cataloged. So um, when I was working on the report, I was kind of constricted by time. So I'd like to go back to the Siskiyou County Museum and spend some more time um, looking at newspapers, um, giving more talks such as this one. And then uh, I don't think I mentioned this, but my work has been um, primarily funded by a grant um, from State Parks Cultural Resources management program grant. And um, I actually received a second one recently that has allowed me to do some of these uh, things like the residue testing, um, translating artifacts, as well as updating the existing catalog. And everything's been uh, put on hold, of course, be, uh, because of COVID. So I'm hoping at, at some point when the, the SACRIF opens back up that I can go back and and do some more of this research, um, especially with the photography. I'd love to make um, an online exhibit. Um, and then finally, I'd like to thank the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California for inviting me to give this talk, um, for all of you for attending, and Dr. Kelly Fong for uh, moderating this, and uh, various other individuals and organizations who have helped me with my research. So I'm going to uh, stop screen sharing and yeah, go through some questions. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, You're welcome, thank you. So uh, there are a number of questions from the audience, so I'm gonna just go ahead and start going through them, if that's okay. Yeah, that sounds good. So uh, the first question was um, really trying to ask you to talk more about if there were anti-Chinese activities that were happening in the area. Oh, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> one example uh, in, the, in the report, <clears throat> excuse me, it was during a 4th of July um, festival in the 1850s and it was uh, a couple angry uh, drunken miners who had actually come to town from a, a nearby mining community and they went through uh, the Chinese community essentially pulling people out of their homes, beating them up, um, vandalizing businesses. Um, and so that was the, the major one that I can think of that was mentioned. But even the act of um, just forcibly moving the Chinese community to, to that very um, <laughs> crummy area by the creek that was prone to flooding, um, I would say just as an act of discrimination. Um, but the, the one that really stuck in my mind was the, the angry mob of white miners going through and just terrorizing the individuals living there. So. Yeah, absolutely. And as I'm sure many of the folks in the audience know that that was not an uncommon thing, yeah. right? <laughs> particularly in this time not. period. Great. Um, another question from chat was, um, did the merchants have wives and children present in Wairika? They did. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the census records that I've looked at don't, um, many of them don't provide names. And there's just not a lot of information. I did go to the um, courthouse to to do some uh, research to see if I could find any more information, but there's there's very little um, for just unfortunately for this for Wairika on, on the particular merchants. And there was um, Sandra Lee Watson um, did a pretty extensive history of the Chinese in Wairika. I believe it was published in the late 70s and then kind of revamped in the 1990s. And she does um, call out some particular names of some of the merchants. Um, but there isn't a lot of discussion about their wives or children in there. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely needs some more research. Well, let's hope that you can find some hidden gem, right? <laughs> I hope so. I still have plenty more digging to do. There, there's definitely some gaps, so. <laughs> Great. Um, another question in chat came up when you were talking about the gold mining and gold mining activities. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a matter of a clarification about the name of the gold mine, if it was Bing Tong, and if that was the name of the like Bing Kong Tong, or if that was a co coincidence, and if you know. Yeah, um, actually, I have, <laughs> I have a paper that I wrote for um, something else recently, and I can check the actual name. I, I was kind of trying to remember up the top of my head. So it said uh, the mine was run run by the um, Bing Tong Company um, from 1884 to 1895, 18, 1894, 1895. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that was the name of an individual. I'm guessing it was 
it was actually like a company because they did hire a lot of Chinese, um, but I don't know um, that much more the, of that particular mining company. I, I, I'm guessing it was more like a, a company that was hiring uh, Chinese to work there versus like that was that person's name. Okay, great. Um, another question from chat. Um, when you were talking about the, uh, the population and looking at some of the documents that um, you had a slide where you're listing the different occupations that people were involved in. Yeah. And so, so the question was um, that the, um, the audience member noticed that there was a brothel listed there as well as children residing in the same location. I wanted to know if you could elaborate a bit about that. That, um, <laughs> that is a very good question that I would have to do a little bit more research on because that comes up. I didn't put all the census records up there, but um, that comes up a couple of times. And they're often um, very young women living there. So, and I, I think part of that is what uh, census enumerators were calling brothels um, weren't always really brothels. There may have been like a boarding house and they might have just been servants um, that were living there. So um, that is probably the, the best explanation I have for now on that. Um, there isn't a lot more information um, just from the census records, but that, that's my guess is that they were they weren't necessarily brothel workers, that they may have been just servants or um, or maybe even the daughters of some of the individuals who worked there. <laughs> Sorry okay. if I can't give a better answer than that. No, no, no. I mean, um, sometimes we don't have all the answers, right? <laughs> yeah, especially with the census records. They, they tend to leave a lot out, so. Mm -hmm. Um, another question from chat, and I think maybe I'm going to pair these two together because they were about um, funding. So there was a question about the excavation itself, if it was financed by Caltrans, and then also about your grant from CalParks, about uh, a little bit about why the grant came from CalParks. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, good question. So yes, it was um, funded by Cal, the excavation was funded by Caltrans, and this is just a little like history of, of Caltrans, but at, at that time, um, State Parks was the only state agency that had archaeologists. So, um, of course, now Caltrans has their own archaeologists, but um, at that time, State Parks was the only state agency that had archaeologists. So they they hired um, State Parks archaeologists to work on the excavation. And then, in terms of funding, um, so I just kind of had had started researching at the um, SACRIF, the State Archaeological Collections Research Facility, uh, because I wanted a, an outlet a way to continue my research um, beyond what I did my dissertation on and, and to, to keep working with collections. And it's a, um, the grant is called a Cultural Resources Management Program grant. And they're given each year and they're primi primarily for um, like, say if State Parks has a, a building and they want to do some repairs, they're, they're small things or if they, um, they're not often used for collections. And in order to receive the grant, I actually had to uh, set up an independent business account. So I had to be like an independent contractor to, to, count, um, to state parks to be able to get the grant. Um, but they do them every year. Um, and they're usually for like small maintenance projects, but I do think they can be used for collections. So I, I think I kind of, I feel very fortunate to have gotten, um, gotten the grant to work on it. No, that's really great to hear that they're funding uh, further analysis on orphan collections because otherwise yeah, and, they're just waiting in storage. Yeah, and the SCA, um, the Society for California Archaeology, a, a couple of years ago started in orphans. Um, I forgot the full name, but it's essentially the same thing. And I did get a, a grant from them as well a few years ago. So, so they do a similar kind of thing. That's fantastic. All right, the next question from the audience. Um, they wanted to know if there was any evidence of Chinese in Wairika that worked on the railroads. Um, none that I have come across specifically that are called out in either the census records or historical research. Um, but uh, they were, I think there was a branch, I want to say it was like the Oregon and California Railroad. And I did come across some mention that they, they had gone up to work on that. And I think it it actually, the railroad grade was uh, ended near um, Ashland, Oregon. And I, I need to do a little bit more research on that particular area, but I know um, Chelsea Rose at Southern Oregon University has been doing a lot of work on some of the railroads up there. 
um, and so she might know a bit more. But yeah, I, I think they were they did um, work on portions of that, um, and I would have to check the name. I want to say it was a California Oregon, uh, California Oregon Railroad. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the next two questions, um, I, I'm going to pair them together, and so it's okay. about uh, if there were other. Um, excavations done in the area. So one was specifically about were there any excavations related to the Chinese cemetery or I guess in the surrounding Wairika area? Um, there were not and I think um, the closest I could find was like another small mining community and I want to say it was done by Eric Ritter with the BLM um, who's done some uh, excavations up there but yeah nothing um, right by Wairika that was really only um, and it, it is a shame because with I-5 um, just kind of going right over what was remaining. Um, and there is a cemetery that's in Wairika as well, but um, I don't know of any other excavations that have been done in, in the immediate area. So. It would be nice to have that <laughs> comparative information. So. Absolutely. Um, Sort of like building upon this, um, another question in chat was asking if there were any books written on um, Chinese history in Wairika or if there are any newspaper articles regarding the Chinese who lived there or how they were treated. Yeah, um, so the Sandra Leah Watson, I'd have to get the exact name of the publication um, and actually I might have it in front of me. <laughs> But she did a history of the Chinese in Wairika, and there is a copy available. <clears throat> I know there's one that's available at the State Library in Sacramento, um, but she did a pretty thorough history. Um, so it was uh, Sandra Leah Watson, Michael Hendricks, and James T. Rock, 1990, the Chinese in Siskiyou County, a glimpse from Wairika, Siskiyou County Historical Society. Um, and so that that's probably the most extensive history that's been done. Um, and so that, uh, and, and in fact, the Siskiyou County Historical Society might have um, a copy of that. And I did come across uh, through, through sort of looking at what Sandra Lee Watson had written. Um, she does cite a lot of newspaper articles. So um, there are a lot that talk about the Chinese. Um, Again, sort of with my research, I was limited to ones that I could find uh, digitally. Um, and so that's, I, I'm sure there are a lot more uh, in the local newspapers, but you have to go to the museum and, and actually track them down. Well, maybe once COVID's over, <laughs> you'll be I able know. to find something. <laughs> Someday. Yeah. Um, another question in chat was wondering if um, you had any sense of the districts or uh, that are dialects that people were speaking. So are people coming from Toisan, Kaiping, Jungsan, so on and so forth? Yeah, um, <clears throat> again, I'd have to check because um, I have it in my uh, report. Um, I want to say I I'm going to, I'm going to completely butcher this. Um, is it the S-C-E-Y-U-P? <laughs> say up. <laughs> say up. Okay. So I have my excuse my pronunciation, but I believe that most of them came from that area. Um, but I'd have to double check. I do talk a little bit about it in, in my report and I, I apologize I don't have it in front of me, but. Um, okay, I mean, many early Chinese migrants are coming from Sayup, so um, that wouldn't be a surprise. <laughs> that would be my educated guess for the moment, so. Mm -hmm. All right, we have um, two more questions. Um, okay. So one is, did you find the names of people associated with the Cheng Long Ting, or if that's the name of your of your drugstore? I did not, um, and and that um, international Chinese business directory, I, I believe it was Su Feng Cheng who let me know about it, and because I I was trying to find directories for Wairika, and um, unfortunately, um, I, I was told by someone at the museum there that uh, in the past someone had gone through and, and thrown out most of the directories. So there's very, <clears throat> very few directories, historical directories for White Weekend. So that was kind of a gem to come across that. Um, but yeah, it doesn't list, uh, it literally is like maybe half a page in that business directory. And it's like five or six businesses with the name and address, but that's it. There's no more information. <clears throat> Okay. Um, there's also another question about if there are any temples in Wairika or if there are any Christian churches or missionary outreach efforts. 
So um, this was interesting because uh, Paul Chase had actually asked me about the, the photo on the, the cover of the, the flyer for, for the meeting um, this evening. And um, I, couldn't, I didn't come across any mention of, um, there, there was a temple there um, that they scheduled sort of the, some of the Chinese New Year events around and, and the parade. Um, but the histories don't, um, in the newspaper articles, don't actually call out the name of a particular temple. And something I was kind of interested in is, is from just looking at the photo that I had on the flyer and looking at some of the uh, images and the Chinese characters, if there's a way to kind of figure out um, what temple um, that might have been or, or what uh, religion particularly um, was associated with that. Um, but yeah, that's it's not really called out in any of the records that I saw. Um. All right, great. Um, that's actually all of our questions. Okay. <laughs> um, so, oh wait, nope, just kidding. One just popped in. So let's make this hey. our last, let's make this our last question and then we'll okay. um, wrap up, okay? Um, Oh, it's a comment. Um, well, there's two comments. So one, um, okay. there's a link in chat about uh, underground history of Wairiko's old Chinatown. Oh, nice. Okay. And then there's oh, a wow. the second is um, the comment says, I figured that one of the surnames mentioned was Deer. That would be the surname Xie in Mandarin or Tzu in Cantonese, um, like um, more like Taishan or Kaiping. Um, so I guess, again, going back to the, the question about um, people coming from, say, up, particularly uh, Tuisan. Okay, excellent. So that, I'm just writing, I'm writing this down. Mm -hmm. um, I, want, I actually had a question. Does anyone know what a gantry man is? Because that was what that individual was listed as. And I, I found many different definitions, but I, I don't really know. Um, so if anyone's come across that, I, I would, uh, I don't know. Medical facility, hospital, or clinic. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right, I think with that, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up. So um, thank you again, Sarah, very much for your talk. I have yeah. no doubt that our audience enjoyed it. Uh, quite a well, bit. Thank you very much and, and thank you all for the good questions. I, I actually had a question. Is this going to be available if, if individuals, um, I did put my email on the front slide so I wanted to let people know if they have more questions to, to send me an email if, if that's going to be available um, for individuals. Um, I can't answer that question, but perhaps okay. Susan can <laughs> as I hand no over. All right, I, I, will, I will put myself on mute. Thank you all very much. Great. Okay, so um, again, thank you everyone. And let me go ahead and turn it over to Susan Dixon, who has a few closing remarks before we wrap up for this evening. Thank you. Susan? Hi, I'm Susan Dixon. And I just want to thank the people who helped us tonight. Uh, Kelly Fong, who's been a longtime supporter of the Historical Society. And uh, I want to thank our hosts, uh, Laureen Hong and Felicia Tabing, and then Eugene for the intro. Um, I do want to ask you again uh, to come uh, to the first Wednesday of December at seven o'clock again, and uh, our Speaker will be uh, Tamira Vennett Shelton. She's an associate history uh, professor of history at Claremont McKenna College, and she'll be talking about 200 years of uh, Chinese medicine. So thank you again for joining us. We will try to put it online. We're upgrading our um, Uh, we're up we're upgrading our uh, website and so you can expect it in the future so good night and stay safe <laughs>